Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the next video in the series. This one's going to be over the yellow wallpaper by uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Um, this is a really interesting story, sort of a, a psychological thriller um, in, of its day. And uh, while I enjoy it from an artistic standpoint, I just like the story just reading it. I think it's fun to read. Uh, there's a lot more going on here that needs to be discussed. Some of the social issues that it brings up, I think, are in the end far more important than just the pure entertainment value of the story. So one thing we need to know early on about um, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman is that she was the great niece of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, and Harriet Beecher Stowe, as you know, was an abolitionist. She wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. And one thing I want to, to say really quickly about Uncle Tom's Cabin and Harriet Beecher Stowe in particular, um, it's not that Uncle Tom's Cabin holds up now as a text that's pro-equality or egalitarian. Of course, there are some racist pictures and caricatures in it. That's not, um, it's not inaccurate to say, but it misses the point. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe is coming out of time that dismissed um, a, a whole group of people based on their skin color as subhuman and as uh, not, not worthy of being free or of being treated with human respect. And so to write this book, uh, to, to deviate from that, to, to go so much closer to saying, okay, no, these are human beings, we need to treat them like human beings, um, that, that's, an, that's an incredible thing that she, that she did. Um, and, and when we have this sort of revisionist look at history, we look back and say, well, because it doesn't hold up to de today's standards, then it doesn't count. That's unfair, and it doesn't, uh, it, it's just also not a good way of looking at history. Anyway, the side note there, sorry. Um, but, moving on, so her, her uh, Harry Beecher Stowe's great niece is Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman has a very unsupportive father and is raised uh, exclusively by her mother. She got maybe her talent for writing from her father, but um, she was raised by her mother. She has this history of strong women in her family, and she actually named her uh, first child after... Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, so you can tell, you know, she was aware of that history and it affected her. So it's no surprise, based on her family history and the lack of a father figure, that she became uh, a feminist, right? So, surrounded by really strong women, women don't receive very much credit for anything that they do and they don't have very many rights, so it's a, a, a pretty natural leap that she would see a problem with that and become a feminist. Um, so look at this, this is a list of some of the titles of things that she wrote. Women in Economics, a study of the economic relation between men and women as a factor in social relations. Okay, and, and I just want to look at this title. I've not read this. I, I haven't read it. But just looking at the title, the insight um, is, is incredible here. How women were, uh, how, you could, how you could view women's uh, sexuality and their work in the home as an economic contribution and reevaluate their stance in society based on that. Um, and you can see from the other titles concerning work, uh, or concerning children, the home, its work and influence, human work, the man-made world and our androcentric culture, his religion and hers. She's touching on all these different areas of life, almost the, the whole sum of life for women at this time and saying, look at all these different things and how uh, this um, androcentric, as she says, or, or hyper-masculine um, worldview and approach to doing things is, is wrong, essentially. Um, so she's clearly very ahead of her time, uh, and that's a... Uh, if we're looking at, at just these titles alone, uh, it's clear that you know this is a, a big deal for her. And this is also where the majority of her work uh, went. She wasn't primarily a short story writer. This was most of her work. So I, we do need to mention briefly just about feminism um, that it's it's come in waves uh, and there are people that are arguing we're in the fourth wave right now. I don't think so really. But um, when we say feminism, that word broadly doesn't carry a lot of meaning and especially in the 90s, um, you know, Rush Limbaugh coins the term feminazi and uh, the, the word is sort of repurposed to mean man-hater, and that's not what uh, feminism is really about. So let's walk through the, the three different stages of feminism. So the first is in the ni early 1900s, um, late 1800s, 
uh, and this is the, the suffrage movement. You might be familiar with the suffragettes. And these are women who are fighting for the right to vote. They want to be able to vote. This is something that um, women are jailed for. They are essentially tortured uh, in the United States, but they are really fighting for the right to vote. And um, there was also, uh, within this first wave of feminism, there was a connection, as is often going to be the case with feminism, with um, civil rights uh, as well. Um, eventually, it divorced the, the civil rights movement. They became separate because they weren't going to get suffrage, really, while uh, attaching civil rights to their agenda. So. Um, that was the first wave of feminism. It's just women deserve the right to vote. The second wave of feminism um, comes starting around the late 1950s, early 1960s. And this is a lot about um, sort of the, the devalued status of women. So women can vote. Women can, um, you know, they have the same legal status as men. They can own property. But there's a cultural and a social um, devaluation. I guess, how do you say that? Of women. And so this is about uh, women being able to control their sexuality, and that also stems from birth control. Um, it's about women fighting against their own objectification, right? Like, I'm not just, uh, women are saying, I'm not just this, you know, I'm not just something there for you to uh, ogle at, or is it oogle? Oh, I don't know. But just to stare at, gawk at, right? I, I, I'm, I'm more than just my body, I'm a human being. Um, you know, uh, the individual is, is in the mind, and. Uh, there's a, a, a less importance here put on women in general, um, or on, not in women in general, I'm sorry, on, on their femininity. Uh, and so you see this, or this increase in pants suits, right? The really boxy, hide the curves. You don't want to look like a woman because looking like a woman means you won't be taken seriously. Um, and so that's, that's, that's sort of second wave feminism, is equality with men by becoming, in many ways, more masculine. Third wave feminism looks to redefine that as well, so they fight back against that. Uh, they, and and uh, the, the whole idea behind third wave feminism is it's okay to wear heels and lipstick, and if you want to wear a push-up bra, or if you want to dress in a way that is provocative, that's fine. None of that means that you're unintelligent or less worthy uh, you don't have to become more masculine in order to be valued. You need to be valued for who you are as an individual. And so there's a, a movement from like legal status to social status to identity um, and differentiation. These that's been sort of the progression of feminism. Um, but Gilman was way ahead of her time with all of the things that she she was talking about. She was concerned with the social aspect of it even before the legal aspect was resolved and concerned with identity before the social aspect was resolved. So she was a uh, hundred years ahead of her time with the way she was approaching this and really laid a lot of the groundwork for it. Um, so I do want to talk about her marriage to Charles Stetson here really quickly because it's going to, it, it really affects her. Uh, she gives birth to uh, a baby girl and has postpartum depression and at the time uh, postpartum depression wasn't seen as like a real thing. Um, which I think it's it's kind of funny that a male doctor could say that's not real considering male doctors can't have babies um, but it was not really considered a, a real thing and so it was just it was called hysteria and hysteria is this catch-all kind of psychological um, diagnosis for oh the woman's acting weird she's got hysteria let's do you know let's let's have a, a generic cure for it and it was a rest cure and uh, you can probably tell just by the name rest cure where this is going. She was, uh, in many ways, um, the yellow wallpaper is autobiographical. So this happened to her. I, uh, to what degree she had the same degree of like mental breakdown, um, uh, I, I can't say. I don't think that she did. But um, those kinds of like paranoid thoughts or delusions, I mean, it's reasonable if you're locked in a room for months on end already having been depressed. So let's talk about the yellow wall. Uh, wallpaper according to Bert's uh, dramatistic pintad. Now you remember when we did this in class, I want you to be doing it here as well. As far as act, scene, and agent, those things are, are pretty basic, but the agency here it, I think is where the, the key lies to the yellow wallpaper. Because when, um, 
when, when she starts seeing the woman take on a larger role in the wallpaper, the woman is, is gaining agency. Now, the actual woman in the story is losing agency, but when she's imagining is gaining agency. And that really focuses our attention on the core conflict um, that, that Gilman wants us to be looking at, which would be the purpose. Um, so I have a couple of questions that uh, we're not going to answer in, well, I'm not going to answer in this video, but I want you to be thinking about as they pertain to the yellow wallpaper. So what relevance does the yellow wallpaper have now? And, and to answer that question, we really have to say, have we solved the issues that Gilman wanted us to look at? Have we solved the personal, the social, the identity-based issues dealing with women? Um, part two, uh, it, is there artistic merit in this actual piece? Um, I, I'm of the opinion that there is, yes, but uh, I want you to be thinking about this question of whether or not you liked it, whether where it falls sort of in the, the history of literature, um, which is always an important question to ask, right? Like, I, I don't think that Canterbury Tales is the most entertaining thing to read in the history of the world. Um, but because it was written when it was, it laid the groundwork for a lot of other work, and it, and it was very pioneering and new, and so it has a lot of artistic merit for that reason. I personally prefer Jurassic Park, uh, the Michael Crichton novel, you know, to Canterbury Tales, but that doesn't mean Jurassic Park has more artistic merit. Canterbury Tales came 900 years earlier, and Jurassic Park never would have existed without it. So, based on where the yellow wallpaper falls in history, um, what do you? How do you feel about its artistic merit? Um, knowing more about Gilman's life, does it alter how you see the story, or or the rest of her uh, collected thoughts, or the artistic merit of this story as well? So, I am. You know, I'm an advocate for uh, divorcing these ideas of authorial intent in the piece. I think you can learn something about a piece by studying the author, but I don't think the author has any additional say in how the piece should be received or anything like that. But the question here is just for you as an individual. Knowing what you know now about her life and the time period that she was writing in, how does that change your thoughts on the yellow wallpaper? So I believe that's, yes, that's all we have for the yellow wallpaper. Um, I'm going to continue making more videos as I had time. I said every other day, and I'm just getting behind because I'm on vacation, and it's happening. I'm sorry. But um, there's my work cited in addition to stuff from the actual book itself and um, things that I already knew from studying this before in other classes. But uh, do pay attention to the format there because you're going to need to be doing those um, throughout the rest of your academic career. That point and well anywhere else that you may go in the future. Thank you very much and I will be sending you guys another video soon. Thanks.